I ask you to fill me with your spirit again, as you already have, but you keep going, Lord. You just keep pursuing and you keep desiring to give us more. I'm thankful for that, Lord. I pray for that more today, that you would take someone deeper, that you would free someone in here, God, as they respond to your freedom power. Bless the hearer today. Use me again for your glory. We continue to pray for our brother, Lord, who's suffering, God. We pray that you would eradicate every bit of cancer in that little tumor in Kurt's body in Jesus' name. We pray for healing, God. We pray you restore and strengthen Scott as he's recovering from surgery, Lord. Get them back on their feet so they can serve you, Lord. We trust you in Jesus' name. All right. Reuben, you're obviously doing good because you had surgery and you're here, which is incredible to me. So God's done a work in your life. Amen. So we're in the book of 2 Peter. It's, it's kind of a new series, but part two of the previous series. And I'll start in chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Second epistle. It was one of the hardest books for them to place in the canon of Scripture. It was placed in around the fourth century after they found enough evidence of the apostolic authorship by Peter because at the time there were other Peters writing letters full of false teaching. So they're really careful where we to make sure this is the Apostle Peter. And ironically, in this very book, we're confronting false teaching. It was written in Rome somewhere between. Nobody knows the date. Even if your Bible says a certain date, we actually don't know, but we know the, the bracket between 61 and 68 A.D., Who is it written to? The same Jewish believers. But remember, these Jewish believers are scattered all over Asia. 
So we still call this a general epistle, which means it's not to one specific body. So everything in here is applicable to all believers at all times, regardless of the specific church you're in. First Peter was written, if we look back through all the weeks we've been in First Peter, the suffering church, the persecuted church, that's what the theme of First Peter was. Second Peter is written for a very special reason, and that is to combat false doctrine and false teachers. And in just three chapters, Peter gives us about all we need to deal with false teachers and false doctrine, which is still very rampant in our world today. And we'll get into that next, next Sunday. He starts with the preparation that we need in our hearts even to just recognize false teaching. Because you actually can't, you will not be able to, as this section of scripture will prove, you can't recognize false teaching or false doctrine unless you are abiding and walking in these things. So Peter has a purpose in this. That's why he's bringing it up first. That's chapter one. It's, it's only three chapters. Chapter two, he's going to call out the false teaching. We'll get into that. And then chapter 3, we have one of those most powerful chapters in Scripture about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Exciting, right? Yeah. Amen. But instead of warning right away about false teachers, which is probably what our, we want to hear, yeah, tell me about the good stuff. You're going to bash a whole bunch of false preachers. No. Um, he gives us some reminders, and that's the title of the message today. He begins on the offensive. The first letter was defensive strategies. And here he's talking about how an excellent offensive can actually become a great defensive. Now, we need reminders, don't we? How many of you need reminders? Every single day. All right. We've been forgetting since the beginning of time, haven't we? Forgetting what God told us in the garden. That was pretty quick. Forgetting his laws throughout Israel. How about forgetting what Jesus told us to do? Peter especially is aware of that because he messed up big time. Humanity, in our, in our humanity, we are a forgetful creation, regardless of age, regardless of, of mental things going on. Perhaps the very reality of that, God allows so that we would learn to continually pursue him and keep him in mind most of all, so that we would realize how important it is to remember him and depend on him every single day. So there are seven reminders that Peter brings up regarding what we need to do to get our hearts ready, our minds ready to recognize false teaching and then later on be prepared for the second coming of Jesus. If you'll notice the last few verses, Peter stresses the importance of reminding the believers scattered throughout. Three times he says at verse 12, he's always ready to remind Verse 13, he's stirring them up by reminding. And then verse 15, he knows he's about to die, apparently because Jesus revealed, well, yeah, Jesus did reveal it to him, that he was going to die, and he's coming close now. Just imagine the urgency. I can't, if I knew I was going to die next week, what would I preach on? Oh, my goodness. The urgency. Imagine what he had. And he says that, even after this letter's done, he's going to make sure, after he's gone, he's going to make sure that they remember in the future. So that applies to us. He made sure that, God made sure ultimately, but we're going to read these words and remember the same things these early Jewish believers were remembering. That's powerful. And we get to share in that. 
Now, if, if the early church needed reminders, how much more do we need reminders? I, I live off reminders. I live and I have to work off reminders. Not for everything. I don't, I don't need a reminder to love my wife or my kids, right? Um, you don't need a reminder for certain things, but I use devices. I use, I use sticky notes, not as many as was up there, but to help me remember, I forget so much. Tasks and responsibilities in life, very important. We're supposed to be productive, but nothing is as important as what Peter is reminding us today and what I am preaching today may sound like this. I know, I know, I've heard all this before. I've heard, I've heard all this before. That is exactly the attitude that the Bible rebukes, that the apostles are rebuking. Peter is talking to an, a young church, an early, the early church, very young, but they were already getting tired of the same old sermons, right? Because they're human. And out of that, that monotony or the bored, being bored with church, what happens in us is that we look for something new. We want something new. It's a fleshly desire, and it's a dangerous desire, and that's the problem that, that's the heart of Peter as he's writing because that's right, right when you're looking for something new, ladies and gentlemen, the false teacher comes right in and gives you something new. I'm like, oh, I never, I never saw that before. You take the numbers of the Hebrew letters and the, you can tell me the exact dates? It's subtle, right? Remember last week, we know the enemy's tricks. He's subtle. So we're not getting into false teaching today, but that's a, that's a prequel. So we may already think that we know these things, as Peter says in verse 12, but we should welcome reminders if the Bible tells us to. Amen? Forsake our pride that says we have arrived. The apostle Paul himself knew he didn't arrive yet. He was always learning. He was always growing. He didn't have it all figured out. The urgency was strong then, and it's even stronger now. So now Peter writes this famous verse. His divine power, that's the dunamis power. I've heard that preached wrong before. His divine power has given us everything we need. That kind of sounds like another verse of Scripture that Paul wrote. Philippians 4.13. You guys know it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that's a misquoted verse. We have to remember, the Bible is not a string of pearls. You can't take one out and study it by itself. You need the whole thing in context. When we read that verse in context, just as this verse do you know that it actually doesn't mean that we can do all things? Now, that's hurting. Some of you are like, how dare you say that? I know, right? I can't do all things? No, you can't. It's, it doesn't mean all things. It doesn't mean you can do anything you want. You can't walk on water. You're not going to have perfect memories. Yet, one day we will, and we're, you know, I'm talking about on this earth. You can't, you can't fly. Who can fly without a, 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 you know, just you can actually fly. Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> Scott Dean can fly because he flies a, a plane, but that's different. Um, the verse, read, read Philippians 4.13 in context. That means you read the verses before and after, and you will understand that Paul is talking about I can do all things. That means I can be content with no matter with what I have. Whether I have a lot, whether I'm poor, it doesn't matter. I've learned how to be content. content. In that sense, we can, we can be content with all things. Also remember, he's writing out of prison. So if he thought that, hey, my, my faith, I declare those prison doors to open right now, I'm out of here. No, he didn't say that. He says, I'm going to be content in this prison, trusting God to take care of him. So simple Simple things happen 
Simple meaning immature things happen in our theology when we refuse to read the whole Bible in context. It's the most lost thing in Christians today as we post single verses and base our teachings on that. So Peter's talking about the same thing. He's saying, you have the divine power and the nature of Christ in you now not to sit here and relish in it. He's talking about growing and maturing in it. And in Jesus, you have everything you need to mature and grow in who you are in Christ. The divine power we have is to follow and obey Jesus. And you need power to do that because there's no way you're doing that on your own. We have the promises of God. Yes, we have his divine nature. It's the nature of Christ. What it's doing, it's replacing as we go along our fallen nature and we grow in him. We're growing into him. He's the head of the church. We're supposed to be changing and growing. So you, could, you can look at these verses another, uh, another way. God has done his part with, for our salvation. Peter listed them. Actually, look at the list that he gives us in verse 1. Faith and righteousness. Verse 2, grace and peace. Verse 3, life and godliness. And then this new self, this new nature is the seventh one. So God gives us seven things. It's interesting how Peter lists them. And now we have our part with seven things. And those are the seven reminders Peter will give you this morning as a reminder. These are seven things that the Bible says we have to add on to our faith. Or some of your translations say supplement to your faith. Well, what do you mean? I, I, isn't my faith enough? I mean, you have to add something onto your faith. So, no, actually it's not enough. To be saved, yes, but to grow in the Lord, no. There's more. Number one, add goodness or virtue to your faith. If you have your, your app, you have the Greek there. I'm not going to go through every Greek word this morning because some Greek words, honestly, they only have, a, it's just, it's a simple meaning that we understand in our, in our language. Other times, they're deeper. But remember, if you're looking up the Greek, and you translate into the Greek, that word only has one single meaning in the verse that it's written in. It cannot have multiple meanings. If it has multiple meanings, then we can make, a, we can make it say whatever we want. So there's another danger. And we'll get into that with false teaching. So it's goodness means moral excellence in the Greek. What is moral excellence? It means to be morally courageous, courageous in your morals. It means to be morally conservative. We, we don't want to not be conservative in our morals. This is, this is God, according to his ways and written word. It's to be a person of honor who seeks to please God. We see this in 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Moral excellence. In our day, we are bold to stand up for values and morals. That's very good. I'm glad. But are we practicing them in our heart? Are we practicing them behind closed doors in our families, in our relationships? We have to add this to our faith. Why do we have to add it to our faith? Because faith is not just believing in God. Faith is not just believing in God. If that were true, demons would have faith. Do you know that the demons believe? They believe in God. James 2.19. It's not faith for them. 
We are gifted faith by God. Demons are not gifted faith. We are gifted faith. It's the ability to trust wholly in Jesus and abide in him. And out of that flows his goodness, this moral excellence in our lives. It's the source of the things we stand up for. This includes lining our values up with his values. This includes being courageous enough. This takes moral courage here, ladies and gentlemen, not to hold on to bitterness and not to badmouth other people. Not to act out in anger or manipulate people for personal gain. That also includes moral excellence. It's not just I'm pro-life and I'm pro-biblical marriage, right? This is everything, everything, the, the nature. You have the divine nature of Jesus Gifted to you. And as you grow in him, it's, it's replacing all those old things. So your values change. Your morals change to line up with God. That's goodness and that's virtue, as some of your translations say. Number two, knowledge. The gnosis in the Greek. This is practical knowledge. Practical. Of knowledge of Christianity and the wisdom to apply it to our lives. We just talked about wisdom in Sunday school. You can have faith as, as a Christian. You can be morally excellent in all you do, but you still don't have the knowledge from the Bible to handle situations that come into your life. This is knowledge. It's the knowledge that responds out of God's word, not out of man's ideas. So knowledge is not self-discernment. This flows out of the knowledge of God, the gnosis of God that we have access to, and the problem is we confuse this because we have a world that broadcasts this message, know yourself. You need to know who you are. You need to find out who you are. Once you know who you really are, you'll be fine. So many people are out there trying to find themselves. Have you noticed that? Maybe you've said it as a parent. Maybe just we, we don't realize the mistake and we can, we can change our, our words, but you know, son or daughter, you'd have to know who you are. You have to know yourself, right? I said at the beginning, we're already in our, in, in our heads too much as it is. I'm here to tell you today, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if, if you find a verse that's not in the Bible, and then you won't be correcting me because it's not in the Bible, but the Bible does not teach us to know ourselves. The Bible teaches us to know Christ. The Bible teaches us to know Jesus Christ. Knowing Christ ends in eternal wisdom. The Bible says, Colossians 2, 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. My journey with self-knowledge led me homeless on the streets of Florida in 2006. Where did your journey lead you to? My journey into the knowledge of Christ led me to freedom and an awareness of what this life is really all about. And yeah, who I am, but who I am in him, not based on my knowledge. So that's number two, knowledge. Number three, self-control. Of course, what good is knowledge without controlling ourselves? It's empty. In so many of our lives, we have a, we have a gap between what we know and what we do, what we know is over here, and what we actually do is over here, and there's this gulf in between, and that's a problem that the Spirit of God and the Bible takes care of. James 4.17 gives an example of this. 
If then anyone knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. There's a gap there, and this world that we live in is out of control. It is, it's teaching us to give into self and pleasure, even Christians. We're called to control our desires and our passions and our lust, and that is contrary to a false teaching. And that's a false teaching that says, because of the grace of God, you can give into your flesh and pleasures all you want. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Self-gratification and pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, is not a fruit of the Spirit. Self-control is. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the passions and, and the lusts and the flesh. So those things are not, they're, they're opposite to the fruit of the Spirit. And we have to control ourselves. Number four, reminder. Perseverance. Some of your Bibles say endurance. Some of your Bibles say constancy. Being steadfast. This isn't a passive word. This doesn't mean we sit back and we just, yeah, I'm just going to patiently wait. I'm just going to, we're just going to put up with life. I'm making it. I'm putting up with life. Put up with trials and tribulations. It's actually, it's standing up and facing them. It's standing up. It's an active perseverance. It's an active endurance. We don't give in to discouragement. We don't give in to fear. We don't give in to those doubts that come creeping along. People give up so easily. How can you say that? How do you know? You don't know me. Well, I know humans. I know who I was without Christ. I was the person who gave up everything too easily. You look at me wrong, I give up. This isn't working out my way, I give up. Everything was give up, give up, give up, give up. We give up on ourselves, we give up on other people, and we give up on God too easily. In the walk in Christianity, it's unacceptable. They say there are only seconds between those who fail and those who succeed in running most races. And too many people now today, even today, even in this room, are dropping out before the race is finished. Because you can very well be in a seat in a church and have given up. Luke 21, 19 says, stand firm and you will win life. That's how you win life. You stand firm. Awesome. How many give up right before a breakthrough? How many times do we give up on other people right before they're about to change? You ever given up on somebody? I have. I'll, I'll admit it. And they were just, God was about to move in their lives. Something was about to happen in that relationship and you gave up. You said in your mind they're never going to change. You condemn them in your thoughts and you severed a relationship and you've not given God a allowance to come in. Well, why do I have to allow God? Because he requires cooperation on your part because he wants to see your heart change where you could take even someone who has wronged you so bad and say, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give this an opportunity. I'm gonna pray about it. I'm not gonna shut the door for the rest of my life on that person, no matter how bad they've hurt you. We give up on people so easily. God has not called you to give up, believer, 
on other people, especially on Christians, which we'll get into, in the body, or non-Christians, who they will be in Christ. If anyone in here has a family member or a friend who struggles with addiction, let's use meth as an example because it's one of the most popular drugs probably in our country right now, probably fentanyl too, but you've watched them, right? They, 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 they use, they get cleaned up a while, you think, you know, they're following the Lord, and then they relapse, and then everything's a wreck again, and the whole cycle starts over and over. When are you, when does God allow you to give up on that person? Never. Never. Never, ever, ever, ever. Don't give up on the possibility. You can't. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. Maybe you're, you know, you're away for a season, but you're not giving up on them. You're not giving up on the potential for a miracle, the potential for deliverance. We're going to look back and say, I can't believe the people I gave up on, the reason they failed Part of it is because I gave up on them. If they had just seen that, hey, we still love you, we, we want to see you whole, we, we just don't give up. And don't give up on who you are in Christ either. And this isn't some, you know, new agey kind of thing where you're affirming yourself, but who you are in Christ is really important. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10.36, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what has promised. So that's perseverance. Number four. Number five, godliness. Godliness. What does that mean? Pretty simple. It just means to be loyal, to be devout, it actually means to be pious, but not in the negative sense of pious. Now, this comes from God, obviously. It's godliness. He gave it to us, and we have to use it. And it can't be fabricated. We can't fake it. False devotion is no devotion, and we have to really be devoted and stand in trials and suffering and, glor and also glorify him in blessings and success. It actually means to be possessed by godly attributes. So these aren't separate meanings. These are just refining of the meanings, right? To be possessed. Are you possessed by godly attributes? Possession? It's not an evil thing, right? I know we have the, the evil stuff going around right now. Don't think of it. It's not being controlled by a spirit. This is God. Finding our life in him and not our own lives. So he gives us life. Godliness is walking out that life. The opposite of this would be humanism or our humanness. And that's when we act like this life is ours. This life is not yours. You are his possession. It's not some sick slavery. Read your Bible more. You'll see what this love is all about. You are his. My life is not my own. Not even my clothes. What, what, what is ours? It's his. He purchased your life with blood. Paul said in Philippians 1.21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 1 John 3.24 says, the one who keeps God's commands lives in them and he in them. That is godliness. Number six. Some of your translations say brotherly kindness. Others say mutual affection. Perhaps it says brotherly affection, it all means the same thing. It's one word in the Greek, it's Philadelphia, and it's not a city in Pennsylvania. 
which wasn't even around back then. Philadelphia is the special love that we have for brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the love that binds us together like family. And we need to understand this today. It is so special that you can love someone that you don't even know in another place. You can be in different parts of the world, but you have this deep affection for one another, and that's because it's supernatural. We are members of the same body. And I ask you this morning, is that how we treat each other? Is that how we treat each other in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. You come from the same source. If you're born again, you can it's really coming from the same womb. Think about it. We're born again. It's a new birth, a spiritual birth. We share the source. God puts a new spirit in us. It binds our hearts together, and we live for a family, like a family, a real family, and not even like. We are a family of God. That spirit in us comes from God, and we have to love one another in the same spirit. There's no time for dissension and division anymore. I know, easier said than done, right? You're brothers and sisters. And that's it. There's only two genders, okay? You're either a brother or you're a sister. So, so look to your left and your right. That's your brother and sister in Christ. You on that side, look all the way over there. And you look all the way over there. That's your brother and sister in Christ. You are a family. A family. You have to see past each other's faults and love them where they're at, no matter what their level of maturity is. As if, as if we have the as if we have the meter, right, to judge someone else's maturity. You, you tell me how to figure that out. I still don't have it right. People will surprise you. Now, I, I bring this today, and I slow down on this point because it's a command. It's a command that you love your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ with the Philadelphia, with the love and yeah, this, this list of seven is, is increasing until we get to the end. Romans 12.10 says this, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Hebrews 13.1, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. It's an action that you have to continue, the Bible says. And if you don't, and I'll prove it with scripture, but this is heavy, you're actually remaining in death. You're actually remaining in death with the delusion, the spiritual delusion that you're alive that you're fully free in Christ, meaning that. And that's how serious we need to take these reminders this morning. 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life. Let's take it slow, let's rewind. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. I didn't say it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. 
Anyone who hates a brother and sister or sister is a murderer. Wow. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. You, you got to do it. You're responsible, church. It is keeping you from all that you're supposed to be in Christ. I will remind you until I'm dead, or as long as if, if, I'm, if I die pastoring this church or if I'm not here, I'll remind you as long as I'm here to start loving one another in this church body. I am speaking to this church body. See past their faults. Forget what they did to you. Just forgive it. It's done. It's supernatural. You need God's help to do it. He'll help you do it. And you can love them. It's a supernatural ability. And you are not free if you do not practice this. That's why if you really enter into worship, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a symptom of being in the presence of God. And you, you, you guys who call yourself the worshipers know what I'm talking about. You get out of a service. It usually happens on worship night. I'm telling you, it's, it's better than ecstasy, okay? I know that sounds weird, but I'm just telling you. It's a drug that kind of messes with your mind. You think that you love everybody. It's bad. You come out of the presence of God, and you look around, and you say, I love everybody. I don't even care what they did. I just love them. I'm so glad to be here. It's supernatural. That, that's God. He's, he's working on your heart. He's helping you see people the way that he sees them. And we're commanded to do this, or we're not, we're not living in Christ. We're half in and we're half out. Finally, number seven. Now we get to it, right? Number seven, completion. It's the agape. This is the most selfless love there is. It's amazing. It goes further than the family of God. Because God knew it's going to be hard enough. We're going to have churches and they're going to their personality differences and they leave, you know, they come from other places and they come from other churches. And he, God all, knew all this already. And he's going to get all these people in a place and they're going to supernaturally love each other. It's going to take some work on our parts. But now we're talking about even beyond this, there's more. There's more than Philadelphia. It's, it's the agape and it's the love that was exemplified on the cross when Jesus died for us. And there's absolutely no limits or conditions to it. God is love. It is sourced by and it is ultimately what he is. So it loves regardless of if you feel it or not. It loves it loves the person who does not deserve to be loved. It's a love for the ungodly. Yes, yes. It's a love for your enemies. Whew. Are you sure? Do you see what's going on overseas? Are you telling, I'm, I'm telling you, this, this is a powerful love. This is a powerful love. No one can have this love if they don't know God. God pours out this love in our hearts, the Bible says, Romans 5.5, 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So through and by his spirit, ladies and gentlemen, you can love as Christ love, not just each other in this room. And, and let, let me just be frank with you. My name is Nicholas, but I'm going to be frank. <laughs> you don't get to the agape love without understanding the phileo, the, the, the Philadelphia love. You can be out there loving the most wretched sinners all day and you come into the house of God and your heart is torn apart because you hate a brother or sister because you, you let it rule your heart. And I don't know how much more black and white I need to be that this is 
talking to this specific body this morning. So this isn't like me with an agenda that I have. You have to understand God is speaking to you. And if he's touching your heart, you'd have to make it right. You have to get past this or it's going to eat away at you. And it's, you're, not, you're never going to be free. But you don't get to this agape without that. It, it's, it's, it's a facade. Through and by his spirit, you can do this. Even for the one who wronged you, even from the one who maybe they robbed your house, I don't know. Maybe they stole from you. It stinks to be stolen from, doesn't it? Ugh. Yeah. I mean, believers wouldn't steal from each other, right? But... Um, yeah. It's heavy, I know. I was, I was thinking about current events and, and uh, the, the guy who shot some people up. And I'm like, man, how... how wow. This, this can't be us, because in ourselves, we're not. We are given to hate in ourselves. We're going to hold on to stuff. We want revenge, right? But if you're going to love somebody who wronged you, you have to think, didn't you wrong Jesus? Didn't we all wrong him at some point? Even if you were born under a pew in church, there's some point in your life where you wronged God. Weren't we all unworthy to receive this? The cost, the price? And he showed us how to love. He lived it, and then he died for it because he is it. Romans 5, 8 says, he demonstrated his own love towards us. He demonstrated to us that while we were yet sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While you were doing the worst of the worst, he died for you. Why, you're the worst ever. That's, that's, that's agape love. So those are seven reminders, and they're really steps for you to grow in your faith. These are steps for you to supplement your faith. You have faith. This is how you grow in your faith. And let's get this out of the way. You don't grow in your faith by somebody laying hands on you and anointing you with oil. It's not biblical. You don't grow in your faith by somebody transferring a mantle of faith on you as if this is some magic show. You don't grow in faith by wishing and believing really, really hard. For something to be true. God gave you the faith, not you. <clears throat> you supplement the faith with the things that faith is supposed to produce in you. And these are some of the most difficult things that a human being can do, ladies and gentlemen. Don't take this list light, lightly. Goodness, it's difficult. Knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness. And then we get to the top two, which is, I think it's the hardest, right? Remember, remember, I've been hurt by churches too. I've been hurt by pastors. I've been hurt by church people. I can share war stories with you all day, but you know what? I don't want to. I choose to just let it go and forgive because then I'm not enabled to have the agape love for the person on the street who is possibly high and they may, I don't know, attack me or steal from me. I would like to guard it at all costs. And it's to the point where you'll go to death for that. That's the sacrificial love we're talking about. This morning, these are hard things for us to do. They are not supposed to be easy. This supplements your faith. If we do these things, check this out. Peter says, as, as we're closing, as he's closing in this section, we will not become Argos in the Greek, and that means barren or useless. How many of you want to be useless for Jesus today? Raise your hand. Nobody wants to, right? 
It says you won't be unfruitful if you do these things. Some of you this morning, you're unfruitful in your walk because in some area you've, you've said, no, not going there. It could be moral. You have a moral issue in your life that you refuse. Someone told you it's okay, and you've refused to walk in that moral courage. That It's the moral courage, gentlemen. It's the moral courage to when your eyes are wandering to a woman, you have the moral courage to get your eyes out of that situation immediately before you're lusting. And for those of you who are married before you are cheating on your wife, you keep giving into that, and then a preacher comes and says, it's cool, man, you're growing in God, it's God's grace. No, 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 the preacher should be saying, you have the power, the divine nature of Christ in you, that when those thoughts start to come, you can say no. And then you're not guilty of cheating on your wife. And you don't have to live with that shame and that fear. That's freedom. The same for the women. When you see, you know, on our beaches, when there's guys with their six packs and all that. That's a joke. There's no beaches here. <laughs> Except in the lakes. If we do these things, we will not become useless. Now, many are useless because they choose not to pursue them and really practice them. So that's what happens if you do them. If you don't do them, here's the final warning for you this morning before we close. Peter says, if we do not do them, we'll become short-sighted or blind. We will become spiritually blind He's talking to believers. So that tells me you can be a believer and be spiritually blind. No, it can't be. Yes, it can be. It's the word of God. Blindness is an expression of the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin, it keeps us from seeing ahead. It keeps you from seeing things the way they really are. <laughs> want to be spiritually blind I was blind my whole life I don't want to be blind as a Christian to be blinded by unforgiveness do you know what unforgiveness does you get so nearsighted and short and blinded that you you don't see, you don't get to see people for who they really are you see them how your mind perceives them to be so the, the unforgiveness feeds the deception and you never see that person with the grace of God. You see them as a person that you'll never forgive. And it also gives delusion in there where you'll even think that that person still is acting that way towards you when they're not. You see how this gets into our relationships. It's, it's, it's blindness, guys. And God's given us everything we need to get rid of this. It also is the reason this comes before next week's teaching on false teachers. Because if, if you don't understand these things, you're gonna be blind to false teachers also. You won't even see the falsehoods that the preachers are, 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 are preaching and you'll be led astray. And when we forsake these things, still claiming to have faith, Peter says, we have forgotten. And the final thing is, in all this, have you forgotten who you were before you met Christ this morning? Don't forget. Don't forget who you are without Jesus. Have you forgotten that you were cleansed from your former sins? Have you forgotten the price that he paid for you? How horrible to be forgiven by God forget the price that he paid and that's the heart of a backslidden person so this morning you have to remember what Jesus did for you and that's how you get access to all of these things by remembering would you stand with me this morning come on remember what he did remember who you are without him close your eyes just for a few seconds you want goodness and knowledge and self-control you go to the cross remember what Jesus did for you he died for you 
while you were still forsaking him, when you were a little kid before you even knew him, he died knowing all the horrible things you're going to do. And he didn't say, I don't know about that one. I, I, I can't die for them. They, they're they're going to do a little too much damage. I don't know about that one. That's... I don't think I can handle that. No, Jesus said, I'm going to die for every single one of you. By his stripes, we are healed. Because of what he did on the cross. Now, if you know that today, you're already a believer. You just have to remember. But this morning, not everyone really knows that. I'm not talking about you learned it. You're here because your parents brought you. You learned it from religion. You have that kind of knowledge. I am talking about experientially. Do you know, can you look back and remember what Jesus did for you? And can you look back at a moment before you gave your life to him and say, that's who I was before. This is who I am now. If you cannot do that, you have not given your life to Jesus Christ. And you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. So if you have not, with urgency, given your life to Jesus Christ, raise your hand right here. Come on. Raise your hand. With eyes open. Raise your hand. You haven't given your lives to, to Jesus. Everybody's saved. Everybody can remember. You know it. Let's remember what Jesus did for us. Let's remember this morning who we are without him and ask him, Lord, help me to be morally courageous. Help me to walk in godliness. Help me to forgive and love my brother and sister. Help me to have the self-control, Lord. You paid it all for me. I pay it all for you, Lord, with my life. Would you give him everything this morning as we close in worship? Let's just worship him for a few minutes. I see angels praising your holy 